My name is Jill Haddo and I'm a sociologist interested in medicine and the body and technology and I'm based at the University um, of Edinburgh. So uh, for a long time and for most of the research that I've been doing, I've been interested in the way that medicine can repair and replace uh, the human body and human body parts. And um, from genetics to organ transplantation to 3D bioprinting, um, the possibilities to completely replace the human body uh, may seem less like science fiction and more like science fact. And our fascination, I think, with mixing up with bodies, with muddling up who we are, seems um, ever more like real life. And actually, perhaps some of what we're doing just now is real life. Um, and so the films you're about to see are inspired by the question about what it is um, to live with, say, a mechanical device um, or an animal part to replace or repair the human body. And it kind of asks the question, what is it like to live with um, a machine or a pig's heart inside your heart? Because if you change the human body, does it change the person? If you're no longer 100% human, does it matter? And if so, um, why does it matter? So I started to explore these questions back in 2013, and I was funded by the Wellcome Trust, a medical charity, to ask them. Um, at the same time as I was thinking about these questions, uh, I was also very aware that these types of questions were often um, answered by academics like myself. And it was rare that um, we had people who perhaps had that experience or whose voices were very rarely heard, uh, had, been, had been consulted with, had been engaged to, to ask them what, how they felt. So what I wanted to do was to find ways in which people whose voices were not normally heard and whose opinions were not perhaps always sought or whose experiences weren't ever allowed um, to be given a space, um, I wanted to find ways in which they could be included in thinking through these um, questions about whether changing the human body had effects on, on the person. The question then was, what was the best way uh, to do that? And for that, I thought possibly using the um, creative medium through art, through animation, through film um, would be a good way in which to um, not only allow people to contribute, but also uh, for the outputs to be able to engage, hopefully, people who are watching or who are about to watch the films. So um, there are four stories that you're, that you're now going to see. Uh, the first one uh, is Electrifying Cyborg Heart. And really that was, that was the first uh, film and animation. And it was something really that um, Cameron Good and I experimented with in the beginning. Um, I was really keen to work with Cameron. He's a fantastic um, artist and I really liked his work. And I thought that his style of work would lend itself to the kind of more abstract questions that I wanted uh, to deal with, particularly because it was ideas around the heart. Um, the heart I focused on because it was and represents still this kind of dualism. On the one side it is probably the most iconic and symbolic of all the emotions, of feelings, of personhood, of the soul, and of love. And yet, at the same time, it is also merely a pump for the body, an engine. It sits within this strange place, with him being on the one hand, this amazingly symbolic icon, and on the other hand, merely a pump. So I wanted to try and explore that um, in the 
in the animation. Hi, I'm Cameron Dukit. Um, I worked with Jill on electrifying the cyborg heart. Um, things really developed over time. I, I've worked on a lot of uh, more medical based films and it was really interesting to look at the sociological side of things and the impact these sorts of devices have on people's lives. Uh, so we were started playing about with the imagery and the symbolism of the heart and kind of this juxtaposition between it being kind of the center of the self uh, but also kind of the, the most vital of organs. Working on this project really changed the way I look at our relationship with technology. Uh, it's quite easy to get caught up in the wonder of science and with ICDs there's a really stark contrast because the device obviously can, can literally save your life but actually having one uh, has huge psychological impact uh, and the anxi anxiety involved with the possibility of it, of it going off. Um, so it's really interesting to read people's experiences and get to understand the psychological impact and how people grow accustomed to having a device like an ICD. I am your heart beating, the four chambers Listen, in, out. What makes me beat? Electricity. Its rate and rhythm set by impulse. Fire when ready. Beating at 60 to 100 bits. Up there in the atria, see where the lightning strikes? Hold it steady. Too fast. You are going too fast and there is cardiac arrest. What we need is an ICD in me, an implantable cardiac defibrillator to help me find my beat, a machine in me. Help me fix the pump of the body, jump-starting the engine with electricity. Once upon a time the heart was more than just a pump and a metronome. Once upon a time the heart was not just the engine, but I was the monarch of the body, the space and the place where I missed a bit because of how you loved us. It's always been about the heart in all of this, beating intimately inside of us, without which we would lose our humanity, my ability to be me. Two things at once, you and me, my friend or sometimes an enemy, so close that we cannot feel each other. Can I still love for you if I am not in control? If I am cyborg with a pulse no longer human, am I still me? What is this device in my body eventually to become part of me? Maggie's story is a short film about Maggie, who has just received an implantable cardiac defibrillator. And um, an ICD is um, a device which uh, shocks the heart back from an uh, abnormal um, heart rate that could potentially put the person's life in danger. Uh, Maggie had been fitted with an ICD um, just recently before I had met her and was willing to share her experiences of living life with a, with a cardiac device um, or in, in my view beginning the cyborgification process and she worked really closely with Ross and together you can, you can see this, this fantastic film where Maggie is um, documenting her very own personal journey by using the image of writing in a diary and she's able to share what is literally and metaphorically going on inside her and Maggie is just a beautiful story and I'm very grateful for her and to her for going through this really painful process of making this film. Hi everyone my name is Ross Siegelmeyer I am the animator and producer for Maggie's story 
and with the help of the very talented Helen Cowley, I'm also the animator and producer for Everyday Cyborgs. Um, I've been on this sort of journey with Jill for about a year and a half to two years now, um, and in that time, a lot's changed. Dipping in and out of various projects with Jill, um, a lot's changed my mind about um, about my perception of what an everyday cyborg is, what a cyborg is itself. Um, and also it's blurred the line between ability and disability uh, for me. Um, I think it's also not so much changed my mind but made me consider the fact that we need to consider where we draw the line in relation to human augmentation and, and, and how far we, we might take that. Through the personal stories that I've come into contact with, uh, I found it quite interesting to see how different people have come into needing an ICD but also how different people perceive their ICD and how they go about their lives living with it. Um, I think it's quite inspiring to actually see that a lot of the people that end up having one implanted actually can go on to living very full and happy lives. So I hope you enjoy the animations and maybe while you're watching them you can think to yourself whether you would consider the implant to be a machine or part of you. Thank <laughs> you.
the animation called Everyday Cyborgs, it was a great pleasure to work with Ross again and with a fantastic animator he knew called Helen Cowdy. I guess partly inspired by Maggie's story and by the amazing stories that other people, apart from Maggie, had been telling me about living with an ICD, I wanted to see if we could kind of put together a meta-narrative, if you like, a kind of big story based on all the interviews that I'd conducted with um, the patients, um, with the people who live with an ICD. So instead of just Maggie's voice, um, somehow we could put together a script that drew upon the findings from all of the interviews that I had conducted um, with people who have an ICD um, to, to give a more general picture. Um, I mean, an ICD saves people's lives. That's, that's the bottom line. There, there's, no, there's no doubt about it. Um, but for some people, adjusting to life uh, with a machine inside their body um, to become an everyday cyborg, as I, as I eventually called it, that adjustment can be, can be quite challenging. It means adjusting to a new embodiment and, and a new identity, and not just for them, but for the people around them. Becoming an everyday, everyday cyborg changes not just your body, it changes your identity and it affects the relationships that you have with other people. And so um, in this animation, we, we, wanted, we wanted to try and capture that. So uh, one minute I'm at the gym and the next thing I wake up in hospital. I was told later that someone had performed CPR on me, but I don't remember anything. The doctors tell me I need to have an ICD, an implantable cardiac defibrillator. Apparently it's like having my very own electric shock treatment. It's to head off a heart rhythm and a heart rate that could kill. They tell me I could have died from a sudden cardiac arrest. The heart attack was like somebody put a belt around my chest and were slowly tightening and tightening it. That was about lunchtime then. After that it sort of slackened off. Over the years though, it's just been getting worse. So, here goes. Time for my surgery. I'm not that bothered about the fact I'm going to be conscious. I wasn't too worried about it, but, but I was. I can remember being wheeled down in the trolley and in the operating theatre. And it was like a couple of theatres, eh? It was, I was pre-medded and I remember being put on the table. There was a light. It must be one of those big lights that you can pull down, but it was like mirrored, like reflective. They were telling me what they were doing, how they cut a wee purse, Ken. It's like putting a purse up in your chest. And there's these wires there eh, that go through that into your heart. Actually, the worst bit is when they're cutting into the skin. This is the worst bit, and then they were like fiddling about and pushing it in. He's just about shoving me through the, through the table like, you know? I feel as if I was going to go right through the trolley. I mean, he apologised like for pressing so hard. It was to get this. I couldn't visualise as to what it would look like. I was surprised when... I mean, it's, it's just a box. I found the actual receiving the ICD quite an interesting exercise because you're really quite awake, but you're watching all this on TV and on the monitors. Once that got fitted in there, I wanted to tear it back out again. I did, I, I was quite, I don't know what the word was, but I just didn't like it in there. I felt that you were conscious of it being there all the time. He was frightened somebody bumped into him. And when I went back to work, drivers or mechanics, they were putting their hand on my back and my shoulder like that and gripping me and they were forgetting I had it. And there was a lot of things like that and the garage itself had a lot of mechanical parts in there and there was all magnets and God knows what was in there. I was dead scared to go in there in case things were going to set it off and it was terrible. I can feel it sometimes, if I'm lying down. It'll jut out a bit more, then it'll go back in. But it's just part of me now, it's no big deal. 
I mean, if I didn't have it, I wouldn't be able to breathe, you know. You'd just be sitting, worrying, day in, day out. When I first had this implanted, uh, you know, it felt very much like my enemy, despite the fact I, I can't it could save my life. And by the end of this journey, I feel that I could, I'd feel awfully strange without it, you can. So I, I, I feel, I feel it has really become a part of me in a way I didn't ever think it would. When Dan was very ill, I was concerned because we'd go to bed at night. This was before he had his ICD put in. We'd go to bed at night and I'm listening to his breathing because sometimes it sounded as though he was going to stop. And then I thought, oh God, something's going on. And then he would breathe again. So I really was. But he was totally unaware of that because he was asleep. So I was very keen for him to have an ICD because I thought, well, at least if I'm asleep and he stops breathing or whatever, then something's going to happen to, to save him. The first time I was shocked, I mean, once the ICD senses my heart's going into an arrhythmia, then it lets off a massive shock. Sometimes you get a sense that it's going to happen, just a weird feeling, and then boom. I felt like, I don't know, it like hit by a truck or something. I felt it throughout my whole body and it was, oh, it was just horrible. It's just very unpleasant, just a massive, it's, it's like a punch to the whole body. It's like being kicked in the chest by a horse. I'm just worried that if I go to the gym or drink too much coffee or have a night in the town, I'm going to make it go off. And then, how does the ICD know the difference between when I actually need a shock and when it's maybe just someone else? Like, is it something that I've done to make it go off? I mean, I might have a faulty lead or something or just be a bit broken and I get shocked, both painfully and unexpectedly, for nothing. It's no me, it's the machine. Finally, in the film Broken Wings, this was made by a group of talented young people from Edinburgh, um, Annie, Mai, Max, Liam, Mark and Siobhan. And they were supported by um, a number of creatives, animators, sound producers, filmmakers, uh, to make this fantastic film Broken Wings. And young people have ownership of this film. It's their film. My name is Kate Wimpress and I'm the director at North Edinburgh Arts. My role on this project was to work alongside um, Jill Haddo and Ali Grant to bring together the creative team for the project to um, engage the filmmaker, animator and, and sound engineers um, who would work with the young people to have the uh, final product. I had been lucky enough to work with um, Claudine Quinn and um, Patrick Walker in the past and also have worked quite closely with Screen Education Edinburgh. So this, this project really gave us an opportunity to, to bring all those people together um, and to, to get them around the table with the young people to, to make the film together. So what I have learnt from the project is that I think the collaboration between sciences and arts is um, an unbelievably rich environment within which to, to operate. I would happily um, get North Edinburgh Arts involved in a project again of this kind. I think the other thing I've, I've learned is that um, you, you can't really anticipate which way the creatives and which way the young people are going to go. The, the best part for me I think to play is to is to be the enabler and, and to be able to allow people to see their ideas through um, to, the, to the furthest point. That can sometimes feel like a slightly um, scary place to be, but I think it's, it's the right role for me uh, to take. Uh, my name's Sean Young and I'm uh, a film tutor at Screen Education Edinburgh. Um, it was my job on the project to take the bunch of participants through the whole process of making a film with the ultimate aim of making a short film to do with animal and mechanical parts um, 
integrated into human beings. Um, so it was a very unique project, one that I think everybody loved. Um, but from my point of view, uh, it was just a case of making sure that all the young people were trained enough to, to make the short film themselves. So we took them through, uh, first of all, looking at uh, animal mechanical parts um, or films around that specific topic that, um, that the young people could look at. So we looked at scenes from Edward Scissorhands um, and uh, Splice and various other films like that. So they got an idea of incorporating such subject matters into to narratives. Um, and then it was training them on uh, the technical aspects. So they looked at camera composition, sound recording, um, even lighting. And they looked at, um, at exploring all those technical aspects so every individual was competent in every technical aspect. Uh, we also covered direction, how to direct performers, um, how to direct certain situations so things look good on screen. Um, and then it was all about the young people coming up with their own ideas around the subject matter. Um, so all the participants came up with their own individual ideas. They followed um, a narrative uh, a five-step narrative technique that we taught them, uh, which basically breaks down narrative structure to five parts. So they all came up with a five-step film narrative idea. Um, all ideas were fantastic and it was nice to see everybody share their ideas. Um, we then ran with one particular idea that we thought would be more achievable um, within the time that we had. And then all the young people worked towards making that film. Um, and we had, I think it was a three-day shoot where all the young people um, were responsible for doing all the aspects from uh, directing to camera sound. Um, what was nice as well and very unique about this project is it was, a, it was a collaborative process. So not only was it collaborative in terms of the the participants working together to achieve something, but it was also collaborative in terms of having um, you know film tutor be myself and then having sound and animation teams um, teach their their expertise as well to the young people. My name is Claudine Quinn and I'm with the Zoom Club. Uh, our role in the project was to help develop the ideas for animation and also um, provide workshop spaces where the idea of the human cyborg and man versus machine could be explored through hands-on making and animation. I worked along with Claudine and the Zoom Club to explore the possibilities of using animation uh, to look at some diverse examples of different science films that incorporate traditional animation techniques uh, and to think of the way that we could incorporate it into their film. Uh, thinking of it beyond just linear narrative animation, something maybe more fine art based uh, and working with lots of different uh, materials, so sort of hands-on making as well as the more technical editing side of animation. We delivered a series of workshops so the young people could try out different approaches to animation. Uh, we did them both at North Edinburgh Arts and here at the Zoom Club in Summer Hall, Edinburgh. It was also a really good way to sort of break the ice and bring everyone together working in a studio environment in a sort of professional context. So another big part of the project um, for us was helping the young people develop their visual language so that they could not only make and create animations, explore ideas that way, but also communicate and direct so that they could express quite abstract ideas to do with the animating aspect of the film uh, using language that communicated their ideas clearly. Um, we also saw the young people become so much more confident through the process. Uh, I think that was really one of the highlights for us was seeing how they came together as a team, how they were able to self-manage and deliver really high quality outcomes um, that really did reflect the, the process and the ideas that they, 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 they went through and that they generated um, working as a team. My name is Patrick Findlay uh, and I was in charge of sound design and music composition uh, for the Broken Wings uh, project. So my job was to give tuition on Foley, sound design, composition. I also gave uh, some advice on recording, dialogue and the, the final sound mix for the film. Um, I really enjoyed and um, was very inspired by a lot of the things that we worked on with the project. I really enjoyed going to the Scottish Micro Electronics Centre and seeing how there are doctors and scientists on the front line uh, fighting things like cancer through innovative means. 
Uh, I was also very inspired by the nature of uh, micro technology uh, and transformation that the film, the film and the uh, project touched on. Uh, in terms of my own practice benefiting, um, I've been very inspired um, by what I call micro sounds, taking little fragments, little delicate fragments of sound um, to make things sound like nanotechnology or micro technology, um, which linked in with um, some of the visits uh, that we went on when we were getting inspiration for the project. I've been able to put that into my own musical projects and it's uh, come up with some results that I find pleasing to the ear and that I have had great feedback on so far. Um, so I really also enjoyed watching the piece come together. I thought it was a superb effort uh, from all the young people and all the professionals uh, and I really like what we've come up with. College project. 
It's okay. I'm not going to buy it. Oh, hybrids. Are you interested in that kind of stuff? Sorry, you're probably thinking, who is this weirdo? I'm Katrina. I need to go. You dropped this when you fell. So you thought best to follow me to the woods at night to give me it back. You're not the only one who likes a walk at night. Helps clear the mind. It seems like you need that. How's your sodas? I know you're different, special. You don't need to fight her. Years. Just like you will have wings. How do you know about that? I'm part cat. We can sense these things. It seems like nothing, but it was very painful. Hurt like hell. And now we're humanos. It's what the others are calling themselves. You like them. Anyway, I gotta go. Never be a of yourself, Ava. I'll see you around. <laughs> 